Hello and welcome to Curly Brace Podcast. My name is Rocket and I am one of the co-hosts. And today we are skipping our intros and we are jumping directly back into our conversation around housing in the United States. Yeah, we, this and is this is something we've got to get we got to get the ball rolling and, and we ended you guys on a on a cliffhanger there. That's right. That's right. And while we were away for a week, Greg forgot to mention something that he really wanted to bring up. So he's going to bring up something about a video that you saw, Greg. Uh, yeah. So I was watching, um, it was just an interesting idea about how we treat home loans versus any other type of loan. Okay. Um, and it's just, well, you can borrow against it, right? That's, that's one. Your home, your home is immediately leveraged against the property you buy. Immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like, explain that to me, Ex- explain that to me. So when I, I got my mortgage, right, it, it, I mean, when I, when they approved my mortgage, you know how you can get loans and you can leverage your loan with like a car or something if you wanted, or you can just get a loan based on your credit and you don't have to leverage right. anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you get a mortgage loan, they immediately leverage your property in your home. So that way, if you don't pay the loan, they can take it back. Oh. Yeah. So that's, that's how the banks can take your home right? is because your home is leveraged against the loan immediately. And that also, that explains why 2008 like fucked up everyone, yeah. basically. Yeah. Other, okay. Otherwise, if you defaulted on your loan, it would be difficult to take the home back, right? Like you take right. a car back because you literally just tow it, you know, but you can't yeah, tow a house. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's why they hold on to the title uh, Bob until the you pay it off, right? Fucking watch me. Because... <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm just sorry. That was stupid. Continue. I <laughs> <laughs> kids, man. Like I, I, dad jokes just flow through me. Like a was that a dad movie. joke or was that just kind of sad? Like a cry for help. Like you're only watching kids shows and you need something <laughs> more. <laughs> this is a real thing. Okay. <laughs> Fuck, man. <laughs> Uh, I need social interaction. It's been too long. You know long. what's great about uh, today's time with streaming and all that? Uh, back in the day, you had to like rent videos or own it, right? So yeah. if like- For all of you Gen want... Zers out there, yeah. there was a thing called Redbox and Blockbuster, <laughs> and you actually had to leave the house to go get digital content. I just Wild wanted, concept. I just wanted to bring up, it could be a lot worse because growing up, uh, my younger siblings uh, were twins. Uh, then they would like constantly be watching the same episode of Bob the Builder or Little People or Blues Clues. Streaming, you can at, at least there's there's some variance because you can just keep going to the next episode. But back then, times were tough. So what do you do for entertainment? Rewatch the same VHS tape that you've had for years. Uh, and it's yeah. just like the same. I mean, like, how many times did people watch like the Lion King, the Little Mermaid, or you know any of those classic Disney shows, because that's the only thing you could watch, and especially if your parents didn't have cable, right? Which my parents didn't have cable, so it was like you get PBS, right? Because that's public air. I, I have a quick and, question: Do you think yes. the Lion King? Do you think they had any housing problems as lions? No, <laughs> because they killed each other to get the house. Well, I yeah. mean. That's debatable. Like, what if they did near the end when the high is there was too too much (laughs) killing going on? Like, like they had the the corporate corporate lions who were like killing everybody because they had so many lions, and the the corporation lions were taking all of the land because they had. I think you really missed the entire plot line of the Lion King. (laughs) I don't think you're telling me the Lion King wasn't about a housing problem. And how they wanted pride, the poor lion. No, it was an overpopulation pride. problem. That that was the problem. Yeah, but it was an over, well from from Scar's perspective, it was an overpopulation problem. From the rest of the Pride's perspective, they had that one uncle that no one invited to Christmas, but he showed up anyway. <laughs> That's a great, great analogy. Yeah, I learned that Akuna Matata means we're repossessing Pride Rock. What? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one thing led to another, so you know. Good God. Well, what else did they show you in that video, Greg? Oh, just like it was touching up more on like what we were talking about, about how uh, uh, the land underneath your house is really the investment and how the house itself 
is more of a depreciating asset yeah just because of and also just how um the barrier of entry to get a house loan is so much lower than what it is to like do a business to like get into like a business because those you rates depending on what is, type of business loan the barrier is, is higher like, right barriers higher sorry yeah yeah so it's harder to Can get a just... home loan than a business loan oh no i'll say in the opposite oh it's easier opposite. to get a home than a business loan yeah oh yeah absolutely yes that's what yeah. i was saying okay okay i got confused for a second but yeah no the barrier of entry to get a house loan is like because it's like how much money do you have to bring up front compared to the whole entire value of the house is ridiculously low compared to like what you need to be bringing to the table for like a, a business, business is like loan, almost 50 percent, which is probably why people yeah. uh people were more interested in in housing as an investment because the lower bar barrier of entry to get into it would it, would it be considered as like the poor man's investment um, in a way. Yes. Or the, I it's guess the, the average man's Maybe investment. the lazy man's investment. But Maybe yeah. the lazy man's yeah. investment. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, cause, cause again, at, most Americans do not have access to, you know, the investing strategies that the 1% have. Yeah. Right. Like I can't go out and buy a piece of art that's worth $500,000 every Friday because I go to auctions I, and I'm allowed in those auctions. I'm invited to those auctions. Like, you know what I mean? Like the, even if you had the money, you still have to have the connections. Can, can I mention to that? Invest in alternative that, assets. Uh, 7%. There's like, I think there was 54 or $57 trillion in the U S as of like 2008, I think it was. And 7% of that 57 trillion is distributed amongst like, um, middle-class to poor. And then the rest of the 90 something percent is in like the top wealthy. Uh, those numbers sound a little skewed. They're not. They're not skewed. Sounds, they sound, they, they right. sound pretty skewed. They're not skewed. They sound scary. They, it's true. They sound scary. scary. I don't, those don't sound right. It's very right. Uh, hold on. Look it up. I'm looking at it. Yeah. Up. Because this actually, this goes, this is one, uh, one way to separate. House the video I'm referencing is called uh, The Economics of Real Estate. It's by this guy on YouTube, Economics Explained. Uh, he does a pretty good job of like laying it out in simple terms, the housing market. And he also likes to compare it between uh, uh, the US and Australia markets, which provides another level of um, perspective on our situation here in the US. All right. You ready? Yeah. You were close, but not quite. Okay. The top 1% has 30% of the wealth. Yeah. I thought it was 40%. 30% in 2022. Bro, the stock market. Come on. Okay. Oh, right, right, right. Remember, yeah, a, lot of, yeah. remember okay. a lot of their wealth, a yeah. lot of the top 1% wealth is tied to intangible assets That's right. that they yeah. have to we're talking about 2022. Gain, I was talking about 2008 yeah. is what I mentioned. But yeah. Okay. Let's, no, no, okay. no. Let's talk about 2022. I want to know what's going on this is this is, much, this is much more relevant yeah. anyway. So the largest share is the top 10%. Okay. Okay. Yep. Excluding the top 1%. So, so these aren't, these aren't stacked, so they're separated. So exclude the 30% from the top 1%. Yep. And now everyone else from 90 to 99%, right? They are 37%. Then 28% is everyone making from median, in, uh, median wage to 90%. And that's 28%. So the top 10% control 37% and 50 to 90 again, is much less than that. So the next 40% lower control less wealth than the top 10%, okay? The bottom 50% make up 3.3%. Yeah, that sounds about right. The bottom half of households, not Americans, of households, yep. make up 3.3%. So that's, yeah, that is that alone is just to clarify, that 3.3% is distributed amongst all of those households. Like Yeah, so if you, so again, Assuming a majority you have 100 of million, the Americans' money you have 100 is households. in the wealthiest people's pockets. Yeah. So, so again, so you have 100 households, okay? One guy in the village has 30% of the wealth of the village. Yep. 10 people have 37% of the wealth. Then you have 40 people that have 28% of the wealth. So, again... Only they have less than one percent per person, right? Compared to the top ten percent that have three per person. Yeah. And then literally the another fifty houses have to split three point three percent amongst between, themselves. 
amongst <laughs> How much more does that top or that top person need to make before the other ninety nine decide to just eat him? But but again, how do you eat him? Because his wealth is in his walls. He has so much his wealth. Yeah, like, he has in... so much wealth. He's the king. He's controlling everything. King. Right. His He's wealth building is, the armies. But here's He's, the thing. Yeah. Right. His wealth is the castle itself. Yeah. It's not the gold in the the chamber, right? Because because again, remember it, again, if you're gonna look at this as like a peasant versus king kind of thing, which in my opinion it is very comparable. The peasants use money. We use money day to day to buy stuff and obtain. Like we 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 work a job, we get money for that job. Then we go walk into a store and we use that money that we got from the job and we buy stuff. And that to us feels like freedom. Meanwhile, the top, I'm going to say the top 10% and above, they do it completely differently than us, right? They don't have, they rarely ever carry around actual money, right? And if they need money, then they pull it out of some asset that they have. That's right. It's completely different. They don't get a paycheck. So you can't tax them be, uh, based on the government code of taxing in the same way that everyone else is taxed. Like, how do you tax someone that is uh, holds a billion dollars worth of stock and they became a billionaire overnight, but if they sell it, then they're going to have to pay taxes and they don't want to sell it. That's You're right. going to force them to sell it? Yep. That's the that's the dilemma we're in. But there's another yeah, dilemma, the dilemma where the really wealthy just invest their money back into their own stock. That's that's a big, huge issue because that, that money that doesn't I, get redistributed yeah. back to the rest of the economy. Well, well. It's an issue, but if their stock drops, then it's an even bigger issue. That's right. In my opinion. That's right. Because then all of that becomes worthless. Like, like again, so back to our previous conversation, Red, about SVB, right? That's how much money was invested in SVB, and then it drops, yep. right? It The stock price drops. Where does all that money go? And I, this is a legitimate question. I don't know. Like, So if you have $240 billion in stock, and then that turns into $100 billion, where does $140 billion of value go? It devalues the dollar. That's what it does. Yeah, but you know what I mean? Like, that's crazy. And that's macro, super macro scale. But like, it's wild. It's absolutely yep. wild. And and to think that, you know, when the stock market crashes in a way, or when a specific stock crashes, it hurts everyone. It does. It hurts everyone when a business crashes because it devalues. the Whoever's invested in that stock will end up devaluing the dollar. I just want to same. point out that between the 50s and the 60s, when our economy was like, you know, booming, yeah, the wealthiest Americans paid an income tax rate of 91%. Really? What? An income tax rate? What income yep. were they making? Uh, back in that time, I'm looking at a... Yeah, this is on what the, was the year? Americans for Tax Fairness dot org website. Okay, uh, between hold, well, the fifties and the sixties. I'm looking at it right here. What do they mean by that? Like, I don't. Know I I mean. wouldn't I wouldn't trust that too much. Just just saying. Well, let's look, let's look that up with other resources to see if we can. Back yeah, that. from the IRS, from the IRS for 1965, the rates range from 14 percent to 70 percent. 70 percent is still high, but it, it's not it's 90%. very high. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's from the IRS. Though. What does the IRS I would, say about now? Say, is it does it mention anybody who's paying zero percent in income taxes? The IRS? Yeah, I think they'd be embarrassed to share that information. Well, I'm, I'm wondering if they're embarrassed to sell well, but, it, share it for the 1950s and 1960s as well. Uh, I mean, I can. I don't see anything on that. I've got literally the database here of going down. Okay. So I will say they combined the tax rates like crazy. Oh, okay. It's, like there used very to be unclear. a ton. Yeah. Yeah. There used to be a ton of different percentages that were there and they kind of combined them all down. Yeah. So, um, and it really, I, was it Reagan that did it? Yeah. I'm the, sure Reagan did a lot it was, of shit. <laughs> it was 1988. So who was president in 1988? Let's see. Cause I'm a millennial and I wasn't alive yet. Who was president? Back in, in the 50s and 60s, the max capital gains George H.W. Bush, sorry, was George. 25%, which is which seems to be on par with what it is today. But today it's, it's the top regular rates for high earners uh, ranged <sighs> from like 
all the way up to like the 80% for wages and other earned income and unearned income or unearned except capital gains. And then the above taxable amount when it started to like kick in during that time was like one point in the 1950 was $1.8 million. That's in $2,010. Back then that was more closer to, uh, let's see, 200,000. Okay, so I'm sorry. That was a lot of facts thrown at me. I know this topic like brings, we're throwing a lot of numbers and percentages at the listeners. Let's go back back and say it one more time. Say say it one more time. Okay. So in $2,010, the, uh, uh, the tax, when those rates start to kick in, uh, the amount when they start kicking in for those types of tax rates was uh, in today's dollars or $2,010 was $1.8 million. So if you, if you adjust but, it but for... Uh, is that if you have over $1.8 million of net worth or is that if you make... Taxable over- income. Okay, but that's the thing. That's, like, uh, I think... I, you have ooh, that, 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 that does bring up a... That's that is income. a good point. That's not like capital that, gains. That's income. Yeah. That is a good Like, point. for example, for example... If I, and I, I keep using art or stocks, right? If I go buy a $2 million painting and I just hold on to it and that painting appreciates to $5 million in the next 10 years, but I don't sell it, I haven't made a penny and that's not taxable income. That's right. I think that falls under unearned uh, except capital gains income, which at that point would be like eight. I would assume that art... this is missing a whole lot of information. Yeah, the, I don't know how we, they were we, able to. Let's, the let's come back. Had totally different tax laws than we do today. There's really no yeah, reason let's... to compare them. Yeah, let let's let's come back to um. We'll come back to taxes. Yeah, we'll, and, uh, yeah. Let's discuss like that. that in another uh, episode. Um, right. Let's get yeah. let's get us back on track here. I, I want to talk about CDBG. It's uh the government's okay. um government's program it's called the community development block program okay so what it does is cities um or counties will apply to the federal government to get this community block program money borrowed from the uh, federal government to improve or build affordable communities okay at least 70 percent of that has to benefit low to moderate income people so if you apply for cdbg as a city right um 70 yeah. percent of what they give you to build whatever community development you're building has to benefit low to moderate income people and this is what they're using to like rebuild old towns or fix old cities and things like that or build affordable housing right these cities apply for cdbg it's a little tricky though so if you're like a big city like dallas you can apply straight to the federal government but if you're a tiny town like temple you have to apply through the state and then the state can say yes or no, depending on the whatever goals the state has. Mm. And then if the state says yes, then they push that up to the federal government. But this is essentially, gotcha. it's a program the government developed so that cities in, um, can, can rebuild their communities or keep them up to date, right? So if they're not making enough from like taxes and stuff like that as a state, then they can apply to the federal government for these grants to help rebuild their towns. Right, right. I I just, I see if you have to apply to a state, I see a lot of places that, that could go. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Be Imagine being a tiny, uh, tiny town and you're like falling yeah, apart. I mean, you're like, we need this, you know? And the state's like, yeah, but I want to grow Dallas. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's like a more nefarious nah, eminent you, domain. Yeah. You didn't vote for who I wanted you or, to vote for. Oh, even, yeah. Even like, worse, they're like, we like Dallas better because they have higher property taxes. So we'll make more money off of Dallas if they apply for this. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Like, it's, yeah. it's good and bad. I get what you're saying. I, it's good and bad. I get what you're saying. Yeah. So I have some more numbers to throw out. Okay. What are these numbers for? Okay. All right, so these are home ownership rates okay. based on different splitting and dividing of different things. Okay, different th- oh, okay so, so we're talking you, about if you remember, class, if you remember back to the previous division, episode. Uh, gender yeah. division, race division. I, I have some. Okay. I have some of that. Okay, so, okay. Uh, the first one that I'm going to bring up, though, is we, we're going to remind everyone, 
in 2005, the peak that we saw in home ownership versus renting was 69%. Yep. Basically, out of everyone who lived in a place and paid for a place, 69% of them were renting or uh, sorry, were owning and the remainder were Rocket, rocket. Rentals. One second, one second. You said 69%? Yes. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Fuck both of them. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Oh my 13. god. I was gonna let it slide, but <laughs> I can't. I can't let that slide. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh my god. Um okay, so here's where it gets interesting though. Okay. All right. So home ownership in 2005, okay? 69% nationwide. Now, in the Midwest was the highest at 73%. Okay. And it has continued to be the highest at 73%. For and it almost got taken over, if you can guess, in 2020 in the South. Ah, <laughs> of course. Just barely. Of but, course. but the South immediately dropped back down into its place in uh, like the same year, in, in the second part of 2020. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. But the Midwest saw basically the Midwest saw a spike, but the South saw a saw double the amount of spike that the Midwest saw. Okay, wait, wait. So I'm confused. They saw this. We, we saw the spike in the South, but then you're saying it dropped, which means people like sold their homes? I'm confused. Yes. So, so yes, people home ownership came, immediately went up and then dropped back So they down. came over, they rushed over here, they bought everything up and then sold it and left. No, 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 no. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, probably. Yeah, because they made the profit and then sold it. Wow, that's super weird. They did that in like yep. one, one year or two years? Yep. That's that's exactly what it happened. So, so for yeah. example, okay, for example, home ownership in Q4 of 2019. So this right is before COVID. this is a great statistic. I think you've just uh, uh, <laughs> shown us what caused this, how this mouse massive house spike actually worked out for us in the South. So uh, I'm over here thinking um, it, it's people who owned homes for a long time saw the prices were increasing and decided to sell and move they were going to make a huge profit sure i'm sure that's some of them but what i'm starting to realize based on what you said is a bunch of people moved here bought the home for a super low interest rate saw that they drove up demand in this area drove up the prices drastically and said holy crap i'm gonna make a shit ton of money for just moving here for a year or two and i'm gonna leave yep. they came in here and and fucked our economy and then left so so to put it in perspective right Again, we have to remember these percentages seem small, but we're talking out we're of talking the entirety millions. of home ownership in the United States. Okay. Yeah. So Q4, Q4 of 2019, home ownership rate in the South was 66.7%, literally exactly two thirds. Okay. Yeah. Q2 of 2020, that jumped to 71%. You know, I, I, I got to tell 4% you, percent increase. this conversation is making me very, very upset. As somebody who had to go through this horrific process of trying to own a home, I've never had a home in my entire life. My parents haven't had a yeah. home. I haven't had a home. And I get the opportunity. I've worked so hard to get the income to afford a home. And I get the chance. And the second I get the chance, a bunch of greedy assholes come up here and drive up the market so damn high that I think then I'll never own a home in my entire life. Thank God I got a little lucky. I got this property off market. The guy was really nice about it. But I mean, I'm just, it, it makes me upset. Oh yeah. And think about everyone else who was in the position to buy a home and then had their dreams crushed and couldn't. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, that's, right that's, here. That's, yeah, that's literally what <laughs> <Yeah>. I described. <laughs> right here. Yeah. Well, you, yeah. you still got to buy a house. I, yeah, you still I, got to I buy, got to buy, one. buy I mean, a everyone run who down, is still renting property. like me. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. it wasn't. Was it really that beat up when you got it? Yes. It oh, it was pretty... horrific. It was horrible. Oh, I had to fix so much stuff. I had to tear out like a bunch of stuff in the bathroom because there was like the sinks were leaking and that the, was like moldy and like falling apart. I had to rip apart the kitchen. The kitchen was like destroyed. You know, like it was a piece of crap. Oh, man. Yeah. Like I came in I here not... and I got to work the second I came in here. And granted, it, it looks amazing now. There's still a lot of work to do. But now in these like seven months that I've owned the property, it looks amazing. Or 10 months. Sorry, 10 months that I've owned the property. It looks so much better than it did. Yeah. And, this is, and it's uh, really nice. 
to all the listeners out there, um, I think Rocket could also corroborate this. Uh, Red is a little bit bougie, so what he would describe <laughs> as disgusting I and was, unacceptable, I was maybe someone else is like uh, what they'd be living in now. Yeah, so take oh, what he says with a grain now. of salt. Like, I ain't yeah, I mean, again, people like that. again. I'm just saying, like, you know, there's like, you know, a speck of dirt on the floor and it's, oh, it's, I'm too good to be here. Okay. Red, has, saying, I'm like, not Red like has been caught, <laughs> Red has been caught looking down on people because they had a Mercedes A class instead of a C class. I have an A class. What are you talking about? I'm sorry. Opposite way. I wouldn't know because I don't know the difference between no, the C Mercedes classes. A I have the cheapest Mercedes you can get, the A class. Yeah. <laughs> you look down yourself. on consumer cars in the same way. Isn't that right, Red? What's that? What? What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> Do I think uh, um, a Honda Civic is cool? No. Do I think a Honda Civic Type R is cool? Yeah. That's eh, different breeds. <laughs> Not the same. I mean, they have the same... So wait, what about Toyota about Corolla? It, so. I'd never own one, and I do look down on people who own them because they're very boring. Didn't you own a... Oh no, no, that was I've never Camry. owned. I've never owned a Camry either. Oh, I that okay. So I do. What was a Chevy Cavalier? Oh, okay. Nineteen ninety seven Chevy you know, Cavalier. That, that my car first car. Oh yeah. yeah. Do you know where we saw that car last? <laughs> in the back of a. What was that actually? The tires were it all flat, a... and it was like sitting in the back of like a dollar store or something. I don't remember. Yeah. So Red sold the car to one of my uh, roommates at the time when I was in college. He sat on it for a while. I think he drove it like once or <laughs> twice and then something happened to it and it was just dead. And he was like, oh, I'm going to fix it. I'll say this and get it fixed or take it to the shop. And then a um, year and a half, two years later, you know, it's still sitting in the spot, taking up our 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 single car drive uh, driveway for this rental house. He finally ends up selling it to somebody for like. God, I think he maybe sold it for like a couple hundred and within uh, and then we forgot about it a couple months later i see i'm like looking in the parking lot of like the back parking lot of a big lots and i'm like that car looks familiar is that and i noticed because i can i can recognize it from its specific scratches and dents and so many things it's like so oh my god there's scratches. the car yeah because it's the, just sitting there the person i it bought been it sitting from there. had like wrecked it so many times and i you know it was a, i bought it what did i buy it for like 800, 800 bucks um you know and it was my first car and i was like yeah i'll take i take it 800 bucks so i'm not i'm not gonna beat that for a car you know and it was a piece of crap yeah. it was all dented when i bought it and like the person who had it before me wrecked it like three times i think it's still in that parking lot. i bet it was, in, bet it was it still is. there when i moved out because like it was like that final week i was there i i was like i was driving by i was like i wonder if it's still there and sure enough we should have checked we should have checked during your graduation party Oh, that, that would have been <laughs> trip down memory lane. Yeah. I remember when I owned that car. Yeah. Oh man. Oh, uh, wait, 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 wait. What was Rocket talking about? <laughs> we were talking about how bougie you were. Oh, right. Yeah. No, I'm not that bougie. I will. Okay. Just to switch off this really quick. When I was in Orlando last week, when I was in Orlando last week, um, I rolled up to the uh, the car rental place. And they had a Jeep Gladiator Rubicon. What are you eating? Available to rent. What, what are you eating? A cough drop. Cough drop. I think I'm getting sick. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, so, man. That's okay. Um, oh, oh, damn. <laughs> <We know>. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Jeep Rubicon uh, Gladiator. Yes, tell me. Yeah, so anyway, um, I did not expect to see a Jeep Rubicon for available for renting, but again, it was Florida, so... Um, I've hated Jeeps my entire life, and mainly because I hear how unreliable they are, how easy they break down, yada, yada, yada. I'm in love. I'm absolutely in love. Yeah. Um, Wait, we should, oh my God. we should go test drive one uh, Saturday, because we're going to go hang out Saturday. So we should just go test drive one together so you can I, show me. I would be down. Okay. I would be down. They That's... are, I, I'm, the, I took the top off, like the, the top panels off, and that was the most fun thing. I was like, I could just, I can convert it to a convertible and I can take this literally anywhere. I have a uh, four low for the first time in like a very long time. I've got a four low gear set. I'm like, this is amazing. I what's a, wait, what's a four low gear set? Like, like you have like high range and low range. 
what oh for like okay so high range is like easier to shift or highway oh no okay. no, no no high high range two different gear sets right okay. so you got one that's for like highway driving or like regular commuter driving yeah. but then if you're like rock crawling or like in the mud or something like that you've got a low range and that low range makes your engine work harder to turn your wheels less so you get more torque to get you up steeper okay so those gears so the gears turn slower the yes okay yes they're larger teeth there's a larger cog so that way if you floor it you're not like spinning your tires out like you're not spinning your tires but you're giving a lot of torque torque to move your wheels so it just gives you more control over crawling like you said which is really cool that's really cool. Yeah, and 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 you can uh you can dislocate the sway bar. Oh, I've heard about that. They with have that with the Bronco, don't they? Yes, yeah. yes. You can dislocate the sway bar. You can um immediately you know lock the front and rear why, differentials. Why would you? With a push why would you button. want that other than crawling? There's no. There's a, that's it. Crawling. Just crawling. That's the whole okay. point of it. Yeah, it's fucking awesome because you can. Because you can. Yeah. Well, that's that's it. That's that's why you want it, right? Like, because you can. Yeah. I mean, like, I'm gonna like honestly, if I bought one, I would probably wear out two sets of tires doing nothing but highway driving. But it's okay because you can. Because In you the can. event of a zombie apocalypse, I can take that thing oh off road, take the top off, and then shoot some zombies. Dude, okay. I want one of those. Uh, what was it? The um, uh, was it the Rivian? No, not the Rivian. The uh, Razvani tank. Oh, I want well, that yeah. for a zombie apocalypse. Yeah, but no convertible roof. Yeah, but it's know. a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Why would I want a convertible in a zombie apocalypse? I mean, so what? You, you can survive be able to a radiation your hair exposure. Yeah, but you're hitting zombies, the so the zombies, zombies will just chasing, yeah. fly over and land in your convertible. <laughs> That's true. I will also say that we have gotten very, very oh, far topic. topic. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Back Back on I topic. just want to say <laughs> one right. last thing. Um, Rocket is more uh, savvy when it comes to cars and car specs and all that. I'm not. I got a Ford Focus and I'm happy. But Ew. I drove that same Jeep uh, when I wrecked my car. No, you did gear. not. You didn't drive the Gladiator. You drove You drove a um, a, a normal Jeep, like a, just a Rubicon. Wrangler. Uh, Wrangler, Wrangler. Yeah. It was a Rubicon. Yeah, Rubicon. Okay, well, it probably was very, Again, very similar. Uh, case in point, yeah. Raymond, uh, layman, when it comes to that stuff, and I still, did, ha- I, I was, I got the hype. Yeah, I was. Did driving you? The, I had to did did you enjoy people road. waving at you? Yes. Yes. Well, I know. I, I did too. too. I was like, oh, it it's a jeep like, waving at a jeep. That's so cheesy. And then you're in one, and you're like, oh my god, she waved at me. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. Yeah, I was like joining like an exclusive club for a moment. I was yeah. just driving I through like know. You know, anywhere it was like from that. like in the back roads, like whenever I went to like uh because I was driving for thank I was traveling for Thanksgiving at the time and we hit yeah. a deer and my poor Ford uh escape got mangled by it. I probably yeah. could have made it the other the rest of the trip, but not moan, without moan losing of silence it. for the poor deer. Yeah. <laughs> it it survived. It took off. The officer was trying to find it <laughs> to make sure it wasn't like an obstruction. Deer's fine. Car wasn't. But uh, driving it through the back roads in Texas was amazing. Even like in the middle of nowhere gas stations, I was like getting people like, hey, man, that's a nice ride. It's like, yeah, I thanks. know. I do love Jeeps. It, Whenever I see a Jeep, I'm like, I'll never buy one, but I do like seeing them. I, I would get one as a third vehicle. Yeah. Like like if I have two reliable vehicles and one and I get a toy, the toy is going to be a exactly. Jeep yeah, I won't that, lie when I said I calculated the payment for it when I was renting it. They gave me 30 days with it. And yeah. it I had to choose between that and a Dodge Caravan. Obviously, I chose. The yeah, Jeep. obviously. And yeah. And near the end of my uh, rental, uh, I was Dude, like looking so, up how much the payments would be. And it was it. I, t- I quickly turned off from that. So, but, so like like Greg, like Greg said, I am a bit of a car person uh, at one point in my many different trips for work. Um, I rent cars, right? And there was one visit where there was a big event going on. And the only thing that was left was the Dodge Caravan. That was the only vehicle they had for me. And it was 10 o'clock at night. Uh, Me being a car person though. And again, I know I sound bougie doing this, but I literally told them I'm going to be back at 7 a.m. to get a different vehicle. Make sure it's ready <laughs> because I was not going to be caught. I don't dead blame you driving a Dodge. Minivan. I do not. Blame I just you. wasn't. I'm like I, 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 I just I have standards in the middle. Yeah, in the, the middle of a nice city, like where it's like super populated. I just 
I, I yeah, I just I can't. I just I can't do it. I, so I, I went back and got a Dodge. Charger I did. I should like have that, done the but... same thing with that Mitsubishi Mirage I rented when we when me and oh. Red went to go visit Denver. I was for the so first time. upset that you guys like that we got that. You guys that we got that. Oh man, dude! I was like, you got to be kidding me! It's like gonna be snow. We went during Christmas. It's gonna be snowing, and we got that. I like that isn't the mirage car in America. isn't the mirage like literally on like uh wheels that are as thick as like a water bottle yeah there's it's like one of the cheapest it's, cars in america it's a piece of yeah, crap yeah they look like yeah it oh it took i was flooring it just trying to get it up to 60 i was on the i was just upset i was like i can't believe this uh it, that was that was wild and to drive that in the snow was such a pain in the ass i am so glad you came with us because I have no experience driving in the snow. Yeah. Red used to live in Montana. Yeah. So he had some experience. Bozeman, Montana to get us to for the two years. Airport alive. Yeah. I had to like, I was like, I wasn't the type of guy to be like, you know, I can drive it. I'll be fine. Nope. I was like, it is all yours. <laughs> you can drive this through the snow if you want. Yep, I drive if it in the happens, highways and everything. I, I had it. I was letting him know if something happens, you know, it's on me because you're probably going to come out. Be we're all going to come out on with a better outcome if you drive than if I do in the snow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Are you ready for the final statistic that I yes, have Yes, please tell me. Okay. So we talked about the big spike, right? Yeah. We talked about that. And we talked about, and I, I really quickly, I'll just touch on it again. So the South is a great example. That was one of the highest spikes and it went from 67 to 71. And then in the same year, it, or we'll say Q1 of 2021, it dropped right back down to 67. And I bet almost so. all of that was like in places like Dallas. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Like, absolutely. Uh, Dallas, Austin. So yeah. they came and yeah. went, the statistics went back to normal, but all the prices were like, Stayed the yeah, same. because they raised the, because they raised yeah. everything up and then they sold them. And then everyone else who was like, oh my God, I need to sell. Now they're stuck holding the bag. Yeah. Ooh. It's awful. Yeah. I yeah. went from being able to purchase a beautiful home for, uh, you know, 300,000 to, you know, not being able to buy anything at all. Yeah. There is one market that has not cooled off yet, though. Actually, it looks like there's two. There's two. Uh, actually, it's really the, let's see, the South. I'm going to go over this. The South, the overall homeownership, uh, which again, a lot of it's in the South. It was really the South and the West had that massive spike and then cooled off. But the Northeast had a more gradual spike and has remained at the elevated level. And the Midwest has cooled off slightly, but is still at an elevated level compared to the general. Trend. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. The, we don't have to talk about that anymore. Yeah. The one that I really want to talk about, and this is the one, this is by race yes i want to hear about this yes okay can we guess what race owns the most percentage of houses i'm gonna guess okay wait i'm gonna guess it goes caucasian asian number two uh number three mexican and number four is black or african-american whichever you are that is exactly what i was gonna say okay are we ready yeah we're going to start we're going to start at the f beginning or, or uh sorry we're going to start at well where do you guys want to start you want to start now or you want to start in 1995 uh let's start in 1995 just All right. for those of uh, the listeners who aren't uh familiar with US history okay so 1995 okay or should we go even further i can try to go no further. no no let's just stick uh, with, let's just stick yeah. with 19 1995 yeah, let's just stick okay. with that All right 1995 here we go All right so in first place comes what do you think? If you're waiting white. for a drum, yeah, it's white. not going to happen. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's going to be surprised. I don't have a drum, 70 percent. 70 percent of white home occupiers owned a house. Okay. Okay. In comparison, 40.3% of Hispanics owned a house in 1990, 1994, but same, about the same timeline. Um... 42% of blacks owned a house. Okay. Uh huh. And then all other races were grouped together and that was 50%. So if you were any other race, 50, 50 shot, 50, 50 okay? shot, you got a home. Yep. All right. Now we're going to jump forward to 2005. Okay. 10 years later, whites owned 76% 
So if you were if you were white, then three out of four white home occupiers owned a house. Okay. Damn. All right. Black owned forty eight percent. So the trend continue. I, I will say. For the most part, the trend did continue in the same direction, okay? Now, all other races jumped up higher a whole 10%, okay? okay. Uh-huh. So they, they had the biggest spike in that 10-year segment. And then Hispanics beat out Blacks. So they became in at 49%. Yeah. So they they took over in a, that time and they have not let go of the second to last spot since of homeowners. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to skip the next couple of years. Obviously there was the crash. Everyone went down. No one changed spots. Everyone went back up in 2016. They added in the, uh, what was that one? The Asian native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander alone. Okay. Okay. Kind of and weird so to group that, those together, but all right. I, I don't know why they do. I don't know why they group Asian with like Pacific Islander. Native American or Pacific Islander. Yeah, it's just it's very that strange. Was, it's that very makes strange, no but, sense, but okay. Yeah, so 53% for Pacific Islander. That's the new one. They, they basically sit right in the middle. White, though, in 2015, 63%. Still miles ahead of everyone yeah. else. And when I mean miles, the next one is the Pacific Islander at 56%. Wow. Okay. Now... The, the blacks have been at the very bottom for the entire time since the Hispanics crossed over in 2005. And in 2015, they were 41%. Their largest spike to date since 2005 was up to just 47%. So it's less than half. Huh. So it's interesting, right? When we talk about inequality and we talk about, you know, we talk about things just not like being those fair, big disparities right? when you just, it, it makes you, it makes you, it makes you stare at it. Right. And you're like, why? The shade why is it like of that? your skin. You know what? It makes me think about it. it and I don't think why I think, how can it change? Every time some, I hear about some wild statistic that affects a major, like a majority of the population in a negative way. My first thought is, what can we possibly do to change it? This is horrific, and it makes me sad. Yeah, I, and um, there are a couple of things that are going on to change it. There is this one organization that is like, it helps um, black people specifically get a house. Yeah, that's good. We need more of that. It is, what is it? The the Black Home Ownership collaborative okay what well, how is this managed is this managed by just a, a group of i believe it's so not managed I think by it's... the government at all uh i have no idea don't know what to tell you no yeah i i'm not sure uh it looks like california also has a black home ownership initiative okay so the state like, the it's... state manages that one that's good yep that is managed by the state so yeah, uh, they actually have a statistic on there that black homeowners were at 42.4% in California in 1960. And in 2019, that was down 2% to 409 Damn. In the state of California, looks like. Yeah, so it's gotten worse as far as homeownership goes. So, which is just crazy to me. That is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Well, I mean, it's gotten yeah. worse for everybody over the years, right? Like, Every it, it, year. it has gotten worse. It has it has gotten worse. Every right? year it gets harder right. to own yeah. a home. Every single year. Yep. And then it didn't help yeah. that we had the 2019 to 2022 thing, and it's still kind of going on right now. It, it, every year it's right. gotten increasingly harder, and then now it's like it jumped ten times harder, and it's still getting increasingly harder every year. <laughs> like it's not right. getting right. better at all. Yeah, no, that that's you're completely right. You're completely right. And inflation, you know, inflation drives up, um, you know, cost of living, which drives up wages, which drives up inflation, which drives up, you know, it's it it's, it's, it's so a revolving my apples circle, are eight dollars. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, or my butter was six dollars. A, a half ridiculous. the tub of butter I normally buy was six. That is absolutely ridiculous. I could have gone to Walmart. I would just say I could have gone to Walmart. Wife really wanted to go to Target. So I was in there shopping and I need a butter. I used I to like, always buy the specific 89 cent butter for like cooking recipes. 
Was it one of the ones in a white box that just said butter? No, on it? it was like Imperial. No, it wasn't the plain ass label no, that was. It just was like, like, like Imperial butter or something like that, and it was. Um, oh, the, like the fifty percent vegetable. Oil I don't one? remember, it, but it's. Like, I think I, th- I think I know what you're talking yeah. about. Right, it's the sticks, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I saw that today. It was actually it was like it was only like two dollars, and I was like, I don't know what this oh, is. Okay. It doesn't match I was any of the other get prices. To that. But you said it's only like two dollars. Guess how much it was before that? Eighty nine cents. Is it butter though? Like, is it like? It is. It is butter, and it was eighty nine oh. cents. Well, what? Like, wait, but wait. Why is why is that so cheap? And all the other ones. It went up to two dollars. It went from eighty nine. Uh, okay, yeah, I know. I know it went up to two dollars. Every, oh, everything oh, okay, went up. Okay. Okay. So my, my, my I, question I get, I get is though. Is it, okay. So yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's Google it. Why is imperial butter? So if everyone who's listening is wondering, this is directly imperial. relevant. <laughs> This is directly relevant. Oh, I to how found it out why Imperial spread is so cheap. Okay. Why? Because so it's 50% vegetable I'm in the oil? grocery store looking at Lando Lake's uh, margarine all out. I decided to try something called Imperial vegetable spread. Okay. Comes in sticks like yeah, butter so or margarine. Yeah. So it's like a vegetable spread. <laughs> I said okay. that. That shit go. is nasty. <laughs> <laughs> was that a comment yeah <laughs> somebody somebody just commented like two two comments down it just says try butter next time <laughs> <laughs> i tried that shit once too <laughs> oh that's funny it's funny okay well don't don't get that then it's, i think it's fine it's for my steaks I, I use it for my steaks and it's fantastic and you can ask both rocket and uh greg i make fantastic steaks he does <laughs> i'm just kidding no they're yeah. great they're great the the seriousness that red puts into the steak making process is just it's something to behold i feel like i'm watching a five-star chef so, <laughs> oh, that was with the burgers he really lets his bougie Dude. show oh greg you did you miss greg missed out on those amazing burgers i made uh he did with the uh what did we I what used, did we add in that meat oh, i used I bone marrow much... in that that meat because bone you, marrow. you bought meat that was way too lean so i was like it's okay right. i'll fix it and i went and got a bunch of bone marrow scooped it out of the bones yep. and i mixed that with the meat and the bone marrow kind of renders down into the meat as like extra fat and that's a really yep. good way and, to get like a rich flavor right first time that red tried out my pellet grill and they came out so it was a it was beautiful a, oh they were so they, good. they had it a beautiful so like red color on them and like they smelled amazing and like holy those were my best burgers i have ever made those were amazing yeah, that was, it was fantastic absolutely fantastic. yeah so all right Does i have this article have... right here uh regarding okay. home ownership compared uh look at to you china uh in the u.s that is something we need to touch on yeah that i just thought I think about that deserves its own um discussion uh, uh own episode because it also because there's also a discussion to be had with not just uh with uh, their housing and their uh, the cultural aspects surrounding uh china and like their affinity towards real estate uh just a little yes. sneak oh, yeah peek of that we should definitely in 2018 that. The percentage of home ownerships on the population of China was 89.68%. Owning at least one property. So 80, they, oh, they, 89.6% they, a lot of, other, percent of people owned a property? Yeah. So almost all their citizens had a property. Yeah, at least one. Wow. That doesn't even begin to speak about multiple properties because uh, i was watching an expose on uh, that banking failure that happened last year with uh what was that big bank that was like too big to fail in china that ended up like it's still like undergoing uh some stuff uh regarding like how much money that they owe and them defaulting on loans and stuff and just all these properties that were promised that were already paid for and promised to uh uh, Chinese citizens and like they're going they're they're not being finished because of uh the official uh reason is because of uh supply chains and all that but really it's because they over leveraged and now they're defaulting on some of their more important loans and now they're they don't have enough to finish the houses that they have yep. because they keep they keep, the whole- they keep using what they have and leveraging it to buy more yeah. land and more properties to build these bigger apartments and like condos and stuff for them to sell. But 
they're not taking care of the uh, ones that they started building on. So yeah. Uh, so here's that's here's, why here's an interesting whole, thing though. Yeah. Here, here's an interesting thing about China though, and I'm reading this with one website, so take all of this with a grain of salt. But ac- apparently, according to this, China does not actually allow private ownership of real estate property. You okay. are granted the use of it by a granted land use right or or sorry and the allocated land use Viet- right Vietnam so has the you same have thing. but they're still allowed to profit from it they can. it's just yeah. on paper they don't the own kind of like how because the on government, paper the government can take it at any yeah. time and, that's, that's, that's kind the of the same, same thing in the US everywhere because, everywhere is yeah. like that you know, I don't you know what they have in anything. China, but well, no, no, no. That's not the same. That's not the same as the United States. No, though. it's not the same, you... but it is right. Like if the government it's... really wanted my home, they would find a way to get it, right? Oh well, yeah, but that's yeah, that's, that's true. That's, I mean, with eminent yeah. domain, with eminent yeah. domain, yeah. But like, yeah, that's true. I mean, but but I think that you know, are you are you paying for the like if so, say that in, if you buy a house in China or quote unquote get the ability to access a house in China, do you just pay for the house for the duration of like how much the house? No, is you worth, buy it, or is it more of like a rent? No, you situation? buy it. No, no, but you can't buy no, it. No, you can't. No, no, it's the same the thing, thing in Vietnam. It's the same exact thing in Vietnam. So here's how it works in Vietnam: they buy the okay. property. Say so the property is three hundred thousand dollars. They buy the property for three hundred thousand dollars. They get a uh, like a. a a deed that says like they they're borrowing the land from the government, right? The government still owns the land and they're kind of like borrowing. They pay the $300,000 payment. They pay a one-time tax, like a sales tax and that's it. They're done. They don't pay anything else. Okay. Okay. So it is like buying, but the government can take it away. Now, here's my question though. In the United States, you have to have like, so if you have imminent domain, right? You can get fucked by imminent domain, but at least you're going to get something out of it. Do does like the government in Vietnam? No, do they they'll take, they'll, pay they'll, people they'll back? They'll take it. They'll just take it. They don't. There isn't any cases that I know of where they do take it, but they will. They'll if they can and if they want to, they will just take yeah, it. Yeah, like like say say you're a um say you're like a a, a massive like you know um let's say you own a massive amount of land and the Vietnam government wants to build a highway on it, they're gonna tell you to get lost. Yeah. And not pay that's you for right. it. Oof. Yeah. Yeah, see that that's terrible, and I'm guessing China's probably I'm the sure same way. It is. like they could do it the yeah. same way. Yeah. I, I now there's no they there's have no... the option to do that. Whether they uh, the government says, "All right, we're going to give you some money, we're going to help you relocate," that's up to the government, right? They can do it if they want. They don't have to. Right. According to an HSBC uh, fact sheet, which is like a British banking uh, financial institute, seventy percent. In 2017, 70%, 70% of Chinese millennials aged 19 to 36 already owned their own home. That's incredible. But yes, say, 70% say that, wait, of wait, Chinese, that 70% of Chinese millennials aged 19 to 36. This was in 2017. They already owned their own home uh, what is it now because the chinese uh economy is like completely collapsing because of yeah this it's real changed estate. a lot since then yeah. but uh a big factor in this article that contributed to that high ownership rate was the fact that student debt in china is virtually non-existent due to multiple government subsidies that makes higher education cheap enough that's so that yeah. you can actually do what we used to do back in like the 70s and 80s our parents used to do back in the 70s and 80s and work part-time to pay for college yep. now you're working part-time just to put food on the table if you're going and you're to lucky if you can put food on the table right jeez yeah yeah that's that's wild this this uh yeah, so I, I definitely think we should revisit this topic with China and how they're doing it because um, well, but yeah, China, we, this was China like over the course of over. It's not like China's somebody yes. we should follow. You know, they totally no, but it's something to see because you know yeah. we can take like some of the good stuff. Mm, no, oh no. my god, there, I don't think there's any good stuff here. The 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 thing with China too is you have to remember, like I'm I'm reading some of the stuff here, like it's prohibitively high to buy a house in China. And basically the government is fucking you. It's true. When you agree to buy yep. one. So you you don't have a choice to rent 90%. Like you you rent if you have the money, but really you're going to get locked into some terrible fucking contract for a house that is so prohibitively expensive and they're going to make a deal with you in somehow. I mean, it's the same thing with like Italy, right? Like in Europe, like there are hundred year mortgages. At least there were at one point. There were hundred year mortgages. 
And so you'd buy a million dollar villa town town home or a vineyard or something like that. And it's a couple million dollars, but it's for a hundred years. So your children are going to be paying on that. I want a hundred year mortgage. Oh God. Imagine if I could buy a yeah, $400,000 like, like, house on a hundred year mortgage. I got That'd scared really of an nice. eight year car, an eight year okay. contract okay. loan for a car, a hundred years. Oh, well, you got to think about uh, how much to pay off your no, house. No, 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 no. You got, you got to think about the value of the land. Yeah. I... Think about the value of land. How I long guess, before yeah. you could just pay it off with the equity? Right. If I had a hundred year loan in America in like a city and I paid $400,000, I mean, I could see it that just feeding into off. higher prices because isn't that how uh, isn't that how hi- housing prices had gone up? Because back in like the I want to say the 40s, uh, it was part of that video I had brought up earlier. Yeah. But they also uh, it was uh, an interesting stat was that the price of a house was so like low, like it was less than uh, the breadwinner salary. Yeah, I think so, like, I think could, average could, income if you was worked, two thousand. If you worked for it, you could pay off that house in like. A couple of years on like an average. So it's it's ni- it was the nineteen fifties. Like- it was the average home price was seven thousand four hundred. The median income was about three thousand, and that's in the nineteen fifties. So you, if you wanted to, you could pay off your house in like two years, three years. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I mean, but housing prices in rates- general. I, again, the 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 gap from the income to the cost of a house has grown exponentially. There is no denying that. There's no talking about it. And almost all of it points to supply and demand. There are just less houses today. And and the houses are not the same houses that were built in 1950. Even if you were to, again, if you were to go build a 1950 style house, which you couldn't today legally. Yeah, you legally. You couldn't legally build it today. But even if you could, adjusted for inflation, it's going to be about the same. Because, but no one wants to buy an 800 square foot house that is built with 1950s technology and that's illegal to actually live yeah. in. So, like, you know what I mean? Like, like you're paying when you buy a house today, you are paying literally for at least, if it's a $400,000 house, I'd say you're probably paying for at least $350,000 worth of material. And it's, tr- it's true. Well, I, that might be a, a bit of a stretch, but I don't know. I'm not 100% positive on that. I, I, uh, I don't, uh, builders don't make, a, I mean, they make some, but you know, when, I mean, real estate well, obviously makes some, the builders, builders it's, make it's, some. It's not just the builders, yeah. it's got to be the architect and everybody else. Everybody's getting a cut, right? So, so yeah, but, but, but say you buy a used house, right? A used house, right? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So if you buy a used house, the only people right. making money is the person who owned the house and the, exactly. uh, the realtor. realtor, that's it. And well, yeah. the mortgage people, it's debatable, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. But, Oh, but, yeah. I, but sorry, but back to the new house thing. You're right on the used house, but on the new house, when you're building those houses, like again, there, there are I would be curious standards. to know the construction labor cost. Like, what does it cost a builder, the realtor, and the bank to get that house up off the ground, right? And then when I walk in, how much am I being fucking stabbed in we the back? We don't know that. Nobody. We very. The only people who have those numbers are the fucking builders and the banks. Well, hold on, hold on. No, no, no. Uh, I, I bet I can find a general. This brings up something uh, that I had. What uh, is the markup on a? While he's looking house. that up, I want to talk about this expose I was reading or <laughs> I was watching. Oh, he already found it. I did. It's ridiculous. What's isn't the it? markup? I did. Okay, if you guys had to guess, we're gonna do one more guess uh, for tonight. 200, 200%, if you guys had to guess. Two hundred percent. No, no, we're not. That <laughs> okay. Bad. I was thinking more Jesus. closer to like fifty. Uh, no, really, not that bad either. Really 25, 25 to 30%. That's still really high. Which is still that's ridiculous. ridiculously that's high. That's absolutely ridiculous. Ridiculously high. That's the markup they're charging for the cost of building a house versus what they're trying to sell it for? Yeah. Yeah. So, so again, you have a 300... No, it was the easiest math to do this with. You have a $500,000 house. from the. That's what it costs the builder to make. It's gonna cost you seven fifty at least, <laughs> right? Yeah. Am I doing no, that? that right? I like the returns on that. That sounds right to me. So would you, it's close would to you that. Do that. Yeah, on it's close 30%? to that. Or no, 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 no. Sorry, it's six fifty. Cost would you, you do, Wait, would you yeah. do that math on thirty uh, percent? Yeah, thirty twenty-five percent. Twenty-five percent, I think. Yeah, because say five hundred. Oh right? yeah, so that'd be so twenty-five percent. Twenty-five. 625 yeah. yeah but plus i mean plus closing costs plus, right? yeah plus closing costs and all that yeah. stuff but 
<laughs> well, yeah, we, we don't. Talk. But that's, that's not the, being that's, put on the builder, is it? That's putting put on. That's the, being put on. The, that's putting on the buyer. Yeah. That's the you buyer. Twenty five percent. You buyer. gotta pay all that stuff. Like you know, there's 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 a cost to it. But we're talking yeah. about just the markup of the house. We're not talking about anything else. Right. Yep. So many things affect the housing market. Um, I was watching this expose on uh, in Canada. You know, our, you think our housing. Uh, crisis is bad. Canada has got it really bad up there. With like oh, that. I know. What's I know. Have you seen price there's of this... a house in Toronto? Yeah. Have house... you seen that one trending video of what like $2 million gets you in Toronto? Oh, and it's like that God. three story loft. Yeah. That's like <laughs> 1800 square feet. And it's like you're walking through like cargo Can containers. Talk about the gap yeah. though for like housing. If I spend five to $700,000 on a house today, which back in the day, that would be back in the day, three years ago, that'd be a mansion. But five to seven hundred thousand dollars yeah. on a house today would buy me a, a basic cookie cutter home, which is absolutely ridiculous. But if I spend yep. over a million, I can get a mansion. How that's a yeah. Yeah. I mean in certain markets, yeah. <laughs> if I spend so if I'm yeah, spending and- seven hundred, seven hundred and fifty, just a few hundred more thousand, and I can get like something that's like uh exponentially better yeah because because again once you build the house again depending on the size right i mean obviously we're not talking like a 30 car mansion or anything but once you build the house the extra money and all that is all on the interior and it's all on the you know the design and the layout and everything else like the materials are materials i'm not talking about just materials i'm talking about you're getting a bigger home like a drastically well, yeah. bigger home. Like you're going from 3,000 square feet to 6,000 square feet. Like you're not, it does, the math doesn't yeah. math. Like how are you doubling the amount of space you get for like an extra hundred to $200,000? Well, here, here, let's, let's, let's first answer this question. So just Dallas County average cost per acre. Oh, we're talking about acre. No, I'm talking about like literally the square footage of a home. I know, but but I was curious oh. if it was just like the base price, right? Because yeah. you're buying an acre of land, yeah. right? That's bullshit. There's no fucking. What is way. the average for Dallas County? This says, yeah, this is the Dallas Fort Worth area price per is uh three thousand seven hundred dollars. That's bullshit. No, that is bullshit. I can't even get. That's no a fucking 4, way. You can't get a lot of land in DFW is like sixty seventy thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Okay, price per acre is one hundred and fifty-four thousand. That makes more sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's that. Well, that's fa- that's just farmland for sale. That's that not first, even. That's that not even okay. in yeah, Dallas. Say, I, I think it'd like, be higher in Dallas, but that does it, it, it's closer to what I would think. Yeah, that first statistic like, sounds like they didn't remove the outliers that skew the results. Yeah. and like no, but that's bullshit. I mean, like, like here, look, here's know just if there land. Is an outlier that could skew the results that much just land this red is uh like over kind of by well it's not really where you live but it's the same highway on the other side of dallas but it's 1.7 million for 16 acres so you're looking at like you know like it's about a hundred thousand dollars so just to get a house on an acre of land and again that's in the middle of nowhere land like i would honestly like honestly it's got to be at least two hundred fifty thousand dollars to three hundred thousand dollars an acre if you look at it from a neighborhood perspective because you're building that's, on like that's insane acre that's insane and at and, and least Rocket, right Rocket, I think I think this is a good wrapping up point for this episode and we're gonna need to continue this conversation in our next episode. Um, this this has been a really really good discussion. Yeah, I I think so too. I think so too. All right. Well, with that being said, I think it's time to wrap up. All right, guys, uh, until next time. I'll see, see you, you guys later. next week. Later. For more information regarding Curly Brace Podcast and the host, check out curlybracepodcast.com and follow us on social media. To never miss an episode, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.